Normally when I'm up here presenting a video, I've got the high-tech dash, I've got the new ECU, I've got the best laptop, the newest high-tech variable cam control, electronic throttle engine, but today, the guys have bought us in this beautiful Celica, powered by a Haltech, fuel only F9. <laughs> So you might be asking yourself why I'd be featuring a car on the Haltech channel that's got an ECU that's only slightly younger than me. Well, this year, Haltech is turning 35. The company's been around since 1986, and we thought that over the next few months, we'd showcase some of the old ECUs that we did, give you a bit of an idea about the software that we used to use to tune cars, so that we can greater appreciate the software that we've got available to us today. So let's get straight into it, because I'm gonna need as much time as possible today to finish tuning this thing on this F9 fuel-only computer. First of all, it's a Toyota TA22 Celica. Uh, this thing normally came out with a 1.6 litre engine. This is a little bit different. It's got a 1.8 litre 3T turbocharged engine inside. It's got a lot of the old school bits on it, so it's a bit of a trip down memory lane to have a look at the fuel system and have a look at the turbocharger and just the engine set up in this thing. As we lift the hood and take a look at the engine bay of this Toyota Celica, you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff that you could have only dreamed about if you were building a car in the early 90s. Starting off with the engine. This thing's got a 3T engine. So factory, it had the 2T, the 1.6 litre. This is a 1.8 litre engine that did come with a factory turbocharged option. The first thing you're gonna notice as we get the down shot from the top here is it's got eight spark plug leads. It is a four cylinder engine. It's actually got two spark plugs per cylinder. It's a distributed style ignition as well, which means that it's got a factory coil set up, so it's actually got two coils. They fire into our distributor cap over here. Then that spark energy comes out to either the primary or the secondary spark plug on each individual cylinder. Um, over the years, manufacturers have experimented with a twin plug and single plug setups. Um, Chrysler in the latest Hemis have gone to a two plug setup. Sometimes it's for power, sometimes it's for economy. The rotary engine has a leading and a trailing spark plug. A bit of a different style of engine. That one seems to make a little bit more power when we're using the trailing plugs. Whereas it seems like the majority of manufacturers have gone away from this dual plug setup and back to a single, and that's probably how it's gonna stay. If we start over this side, we've got a factory intake manifold coming through a factory cable style throttle body. A bit of a look here though, we've got our normal cable here that that's coming from the throttle pedal. Over here, this is something that used to happen back in the day as well. There's a second cable here, runs all the way around, down to a valve down the bottom here. That's actually an aftermarket cruise control system. So that cable goes down there to a little control system. There's gonna be a little computer and probably a little stalk in there somewhere to do our cruise control configuration. Something you don't see every day now, where normally now we'd add an electronic throttle and it'd all get done through the engine management system. This was a full mechanical way to do it. As we come down from the intake manifold, the boosted air from the turbocharger, have a look at this. There's no inner cooler. That was really common back in the day as well. So before we would cut up the cars and put big front mounts across the front, it was easier to just put the hot pipe straight into the intake manifold. Uh, remember like a, the Holden Commodore turbo or the, the, the VL Commodore? That had that pipe that went straight across the top. Uh, Cordia turbo, hot pipe straight in. It was only sort of once we got sort of the Nissan S13s and that sort of era of very late 80s, sort of early 90s, that a lot of cars started to come pre-intercooled. And when they did, they had an intercooler sort of tiny little thing that was just off to the side somewhere. We've got a period age blower valve there. Looks about right. I don't know really what brand that is, but I don't know what brand that is. I also don't really know much about the turbocharger. Now we'll see a whole bunch of really common brands this thing, really, really skinny front housing. Off the front, it says Turbite Dynamics Schwitzer, which is probably a brand from back in the day where names have changed. Off the front here as well of the waste gate, this one says Normal Air Garrett Manufacturing Melbourne. So this could be one of the very, very earliest Garrett external waste gates that I've ever seen. I'm assuming it comes off some type of factory car, but I have no idea which one. 
down in the corner of the engine bay here is something that's pretty cool that I haven't seen for a while either. It's got an electronic thermofan controller, which is all self-contained. So it's got its own temperature sensor. It's got a little digital display on it, which is pretty cool. So that tells you your coolant temp down here. It's got a little relay base there, and that's what turns the fan on and off. Nowadays, we do it all through the engine management system. So that means there aren't so many sort of modules all through the engine bay, but that's something that's pretty cool to see. Over here, something that's really not that period correct for this car is a TurboSmart, uh, a dual, what's we got here? A dual stage boost controller. These were around in sort of the late 90s where it's sort of got two individual stages and two like pneumatic circuits in there to have two different boost levels. One of the things I didn't say before is written across the front of the wastegate here, it tells us that it's got a five pound spring preloaded and do not open under any circumstances. <laughs> Well, enough about this historic engine. Let's get inside, tune it like it's 1989. <laughs> Now before we venture down the rabbit hole of tuning the older engine management systems, you have to remember, things were different then. This is a DOS based computer. That's because at the time this thing was designed, Windows was in its absolute infancy. For some of the older guys who knew a bit about computers, Windows I think 3.11 was around at the time of the F9 and then they ventured into the Windows 95, then Windows 98, then Windows 2000. Um, mind you, they were all fairly sort of DOS based systems and I've managed to secure this old Dell laptop that's still one of the DOS based computers, meaning that I'm gonna be able to use it to program this F9 computer. The next complication is physically connecting the ECU to the computer. So this thing has got what we call a DB9 or a serial connector. Anything that's been made in the last 15 years or so, it's all USB, the drivers are all available, you plug it in, Windows does the work and you're away. Not in this case. We need to plug this DB9 nine pin plug into the back of our laptop. We need to go into the Haltech software. We need to configure which port and which speed it's gonna be communicating with. Mind you, you don't need to worry about any of this stuff anymore. All of this is a thing of the past, but it's pretty retro. It's pretty cool going through and figuring it all out and seeing it all communicate. And if you needed any help getting your laptop online or getting your car started and running, don't worry about Facebook forums. Don't worry about forums. Don't, don't worry about bulletin board systems. Hell, you wouldn't even get a PDF. You know what you got? A printed manual and smells like a library. So a library is a place where they used to store all of the books and you'd go there and sit quietly and you'd collect a book, you'd read it, you'd sign it out, then you'd put it straight back into the library for those of you who don't know what that is. In the front of the book here, we've got our specifications for the type of laptop that you would need. And I'll read a bit of this out. So we need an IBM compatible laptop, preferably 512K of RAM. Uh, will run on 256K, so... It will run on a quarter of a megabyte, uh, preferably half a megabyte of RAM though, so that's good to know. Uh, the drive, so this thing used to get supplied with either a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, so that was about that big, or a three and a half inch. That was the harder sort of disk, they're about that big. Uh, that's the inspiration for the save icon in most Windows sort of software now. Wow, that is crazy. Well, the next thing we need to do, get online with it, give you a bit of a DOS com command prompt lesson to show you how to open the software, then we'll try and tune this thing. All right, so I've plugged my serial cable into the back of the laptop, no USB on this thing. We hit go. Uh, sorry, one of the other things while it's booting up here, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, Keep in mind, we're not doing any screen grabs or anything to show you through this because the laptop doesn't have a HDMI port and we can't get it into any of the current cameras. First screen that we've come up to here, I've kept pressing F8 as this thing's booting. So this is one of the things where you chose to go into Windows 98 or if you went straight into what was called DOS or the MS DOS prompt. That's where we wanted to get to. So I'm gonna go Command Prompt Only, then C drive. So that's telling us we're looking at the hard drive now. If I type in D-I-R, 
that lists all the directories, sort of like clicking on my computer. Down the bottom there, Haltech. So if I go CD, change directory, Haltech, enter. Now I'm in the Haltech directory. I type DIR to list all of the files that are in there. And this computer's got E6K, one of my old favorites, a couple of base maps, a Celica, an RB30, a VL test from, I don't know, a long time ago, and then some of the F9 software. So now, no touch screen, can't double click, nothing like that. I type in the exact file name. So F9V506, enter. There it is. That is the F9 software. Next thing I'm going to do, I'll turn the ignition on. All right, so now that computer's powered up, press Y to go online. Y, here we go. This is loading the memory out of the F9 ECU at the moment. It's actually surprisingly fast to go online, awkwardly. Once we get over the impressiveness of this first page, we'll go into File. We can load a map, save a map, or erase everything in the ECU. We go across to the Maps section. I'm going to come back to that in a second. If we go over to the setup, the main setup, how many cylinders? Has it got a map sensor? What size map sensor? What size rev limiter? Do you want to be in imperial or metric units? Do you want the maximum RPM to be 10,000 or do you want the maximum RPM to be 16,000? Road speed value. So this was the calibration. So that's basically saying how many pulses per kilometer is that road speed input getting in order to get road speed onto the F9 computer. Uh, no serial output, no CAN output. This data is not getting sent across to a dash or anything like that. So uh, a lot of this stuff was pretty pointless. Trim control. This was an interesting one. So back in the day, you had a, a three pin sort of trim controller and you were expected that you would cruise around and you would shoot, twist, twist that knob back and forward in order to get, like you'd change your fueling based on like a volume knob. Pretty wild. If we go to our fuel setup, all of this sort of stuff was our real basic fueling. So remembering that this thing was pretty straightforward, all it did, it had four injector outputs. It would fire all the injectors at the same time. That ignition divide by, that's asking how many injection events you want per ignition event. Uh, it, it was so much more complicated. Yeah, the help book is there, but the help did, didn't really tell us a whole lot and you really needed to know, know a lot about engine management to get a result here. If we go to the engine data page, this is it. This is what you get and this is so it's showing us engine RPM, manifold pressure, coolant temp, throttle, air temperature, battery voltage, everything's getting displayed there for us. And I'll come back now to our maps that we're used to seeing 2D, 3D, um, all these beautiful displays that are all rendered within Windows so they all look lovely. Not here. What's going on here? If I press the space bar, that takes us back to where we are right now. So that is zero load. So we're not in vacuum, we're not in boost. We're at zero RPM up the top here. If I press N for next, now I'm at 500 RPM. N for next, 1000 RPM. N for next, 1500 RPM. And I now have to go up and down, left and right arrows, page down, page up on each of these cells in order to get the fueling right for all of these different tables. This, this is how it was done. And yeah, I know I'm picking on it a little bit now, but look, this was sort of all set up and configured in, in the late 80s. That's pretty amazing to have a graphical interface. A lot of the software at the time looked like the most basic 2D sort of Excel spreadsheet you could ever imagine and you would have to go through and manually type in every single fuel value. Uh, at the time, this was pretty cutting edge. Before we start this thing up and try and give it a tune, um, one of the things that I did want to point out was something pretty amazing. Back in 1986, when Haltech first started, they actually held the patents for real-time engine management. And what that means is that before then, any tuning change that was made used to have to get applied, turn the power the ECU down, power the ECU back up, and then start it again. Current day ECUs, that's just not how it works anymore. And that's what I'm going to show you here is pressing page up and page down and watching those bars move up and down. 
changes the engine in real time. And that's what Haltech held the patents for, which is pretty amazing. And that was the first in the entire world to do that. So real breakthrough technology. Well, we've spoken enough. Let's start her up and do some F9 tuning. <laughs> so with the camera over my shoulder, you can see the real time engine data here. We've got the engine speed. If I bring the revs up a little bit, it's telling us what's going on. Our manifold pressure, our coolant temp, we're at 82. <laughs> That's some 3T raw power right there. Wow. So, I'm gonna come across here to our fuel map, to our zero RPM. All right, so, zero RPM, these would be the bars for starting the engine. We go in for next, 500 RPM. There we are, nothing, in for next, 1,000. Here we are, that right there, they're the bars that the ECU is looking at right now while the thing's sitting there idling. So, if I go up, 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 this is how long it would take, seriously. Up, 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 up. You can hear it change note and it's now super rich. Down, down, down. Down, down, down. Okay, I'm gonna pull that down a little bit more. Oh, no. Now it's too lean and it's hunting. Up, up, up. Oh, control up and down, big changes. I think it was shift. Here we go, shift up and down, very small changes. Down the bottom here, I can see the actual injection time. So these are all the things, the, the shortcut keys, the hotcut keys, you, you needed to learn all of this stuff and you needed a huge amount of patience. Remembering, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there weren't too many dynos around, so it was very complicated to tune an engine. Uh, it really does give me an appreciation for all of the functions and all of the, the beautiful software and the, the graphical user interfaces we've got today across all brands of engine management. I think everyone's done a really great job of putting the power into the hands of the users. One more thing to note about all the older engine management systems, yes, while they're fully programmable, sometimes it just wasn't, like, it wasn't possible to get the level of tune out of these cars that you can get out of any of the current technology. So when things like fans turn on and off, there weren't any injector dead time tables, there was no latency tables, there's none of that sort of stuff. So once you had tuned a car and yep, you've tuned the car as a race car, no longer as a street car, well, sometimes there were sacrifices that just had to be made. Today, we don't stand for that stuff. The car needs to drive perfectly on the track, it needs to start perfect, it needs to idle perfectly. Hell, this thing doesn't even have an idle control output. So as you can see, we've got 32 load bars. We've got up to 32 RPM sites on our fuel only ECU. But remembering that fueling's only half of it, I've also got to get out there with that old dizzy thing, give that a little bit of a twist. So that's doing the ignition side of things. So I'm gonna have a bit of a look at that. That's got an vacuum advance system on it. So I'll have a bit of a look. Uh, we don't have a dizzy bench anymore. So I'll have a quick look at that. If all becomes too complicated, this might end up getting a new high-tech engine management system, but I am gonna persist through the night with the F9. It might take me a while, but I'm certainly enjoying having a bit of a play. And that's inspired us to run a competition based on your old Haltech series ECUs. So if you've got an old Haltech in your old car, please cruise on over to our Facebook page, comment on the competition post, tell us which old Haltech ECU you've got, what type of car it's in. The first five posts are gonna get one of these 35th anniversary Haltech hoodies. Well, as always, it's been a blast. I'm in a TA22 Celica, one of the cars that I always wanted as a kid and now I can't afford as an adult. I'm gonna try and get my tune on. See you next time.